Okay, welcome back to. All right, welcome back to uh, the conclusion of the ethical tax task lecture video. Now we're going to cover natural law. Natural law is going to be the first of the objective versions of ethics, uh, ethical objectivist version. Let's go over to to our. Uh, picture here of our ladder. We've looked at subjective ethical relativism. We looked at conventional ethical relativism. Now we're going to look at natural law as one of the rungs on the ladder to keep us out of the pit of nihilism. So uh, that's, that's where we are. Let me get us back to our presentation. Natural law, the idea, we first get it from the Greeks, from Stoic philosophers. And uh, the Greek conception of the world was... Um, they're a little bit different, or very different than our conception of the world. Uh, it had to deal with um, a, a central reality and emanations that that came out from that. It's kind of like layers, if you would. And um, so, as you got further and further away from this ultimate reality, which, if we were to talk about Plato and the uh, the realm of the forms, uh, which would probably be somewhere where we're, that we're talking about there. Um, you have the idea of the logos spermaticos, or a rational seed or, that each person would have. And so the, the word logos means a word or more of a, a kind of like a mind. So in Greek thought, every person had the capability to be rational. Be, it was inherent in being human. You had the, this capability. And the Stoics uh, viewed themselves as, as cosmopolitans, which meant people of the cosmos, people of, of the universe, who imposed a universal standard on all societies, evaluating various positive laws by the universal standard of reason. So for the Stoics, reason could tell you what is right or wrong. And every human could use reason because every human was um, part of the uh, the world and every human had this rational seed inside of them. Now that doesn't mean that every person would use reason to the same extent or the same ability, but they all had that ability and had the capability of figuring out what was right or wrong. So because of that, you were able to um, determine what you should or shouldn't do, how you should live using reason. And natural law, we see it beginning with the Greeks, but it is very formative in the uh, Christian church, particularly the Catholic church. Uh, Thomas of Aquinas, you see his dates 1225 to 1274 here. He was uh, one of the most influential, one of the two most influential figures in the Catholic church, uh, doctors of the church. And um, he was very influenced by this thought, by uh, Aristotle, actually. He, uh, he proposed that human, the human purpose is to live a rational life, and a rational life is one that is aligned with the purposes of humans, what humans were designed for. Now, some of the differences between Thomas and between the Greeks would be the conception of, of reality and the conception of divinity, for Thomas being a Christian, a medieval Christian, versus a, uh, a Greek, you would have different conceptions of God. The, the God of the Greek philosophers was more, it wasn't really the, the pantheon of the Greeks that we think of with Zeus and Poseidon and all of that. That was there, but the Greeks also had a concept of God that was more like monotheism that would so, sometimes called the God of the philosophers. And so the Greeks and medieval Christians had a lot in common. Uh, looking at what Aristotle wrote, which you, you, we find that Thomas is very influenced by, reason is the true self of every man, since it is the supreme and better part. It will be strange, then, if he should choose not his own life, but some others. What is naturally proper to every creature is the highest and pleasantest for him. And so to man this will be the life of reason, since reason is, in the highest sense, a man's self. So this is from his Nicomachean Ethics. So reason, then, is not only what humans should do, it is part of the design of humanity. And it is what is most pleasant for us to use when we are 
being rational, that is what is the most pleasurable thing for us. It's how we are designed. It's we are, func we are functioning right when we are being reasonable, when we use reason and logic. Okay, Look at that compared with what Thomas wrote in his Summa Theologica, which is his great work on theology. To the natural law belong those things to which a man is inclined to act naturally. And among these things it is proper for to a man to be inclined to act according to reason. Hence the first precept of the law, that good is to be done and promoted and evil is to be avoided. All other precepts of the natural law are based upon this, so that all the things which practical reason naturally apprehends as man's good belong to the precepts of the natural law under the form of things to be done or avoided. So we can see some similarities here that reason and acting according to reason are very important. Okay, So for natural law, the, one of the key things to remember, a natural law approach to ethics is based off of reason. So how do you determine what is right or wrong with natural law? You use reason or logic. Okay, So you, you use this capability of humans. So, because all humans who have ever existed have the capability for reason, and wherever they lived, they have this capability for reason, then natural law, or the precepts that you get from natural law, these moral principles, can be objective, because they could be figured out, and they would apply to every human who has ever lived, at any time, and in any place. So they are universal, because every human has the capability to be reasonable, so every human has the obligation and the ability to figure out what they should or should not do. Now, some of the key ideas coming from natural law, again, we rely on Poyman. For these, humans have an essential rational nature established by God, who designed us to live and flourish in prescribed ways. We first see this coming from Aristotle and from the Stoic philosophers, and, of course, their concept of God was something that is kind of like a monotheistic God. Uh, it's certainly not uh, a Christian or Jewish view of God, but it is a view of God that is uh, similar to a monotheistic God in some ways. Okay, It's not the, the Greek cultic gods of the Greek pantheon. But, so, but the idea that humans are essentially rational, uh, and, and we have a design or a way that we should live. Um, the next bullet point, even without knowledge of God, reason as the essence of our nature can discover the laws necessary for human flourishing. So Aristotle proposes this, and the, Thomas develops it. So even without some kind of divine revelation or interaction with God, we have the ability to use reason, and we can figure out what is good and what is bad for humans. And those things are objective. So the reason can be used apart from any kind of religious significance to determine what is right or wrong, because that's part of what it means to be a human. So that's the second bullet point. The third bullet point, the natural laws are universal and unchangeable, and one should use them to judge individual societies and their positive laws. Positive or actual laws not in line with the natural law are not truly laws themselves, but counterfeits. That comes from Stoic thought. So, this idea that we should be able to use reason to determine what is right and what is wrong. And when we have used reason to determine what's right or wrong, we look at what the actual published law is, what the law of the particular group is. And if that law is in alignment with the natural law, then it is a real law. It's good. If it contrasts with that, if it goes against it, then it is a false law, it's a counterfeit law, and it should not be obeyed. What you should do is what the natural law prescribes, not what um, a law of a country or a man prescribes, if that law contradicts the natural law. So these are some of the, the aspects here, or these key ideas for the natural law. So, um, continuing looking at natural law, moral laws are objective and reason can sort out what they are. So, we, these aren't, aren't opinions, they aren't based on society, they are objective, and how do we determine what they are? We use reason. So, what should happen when two or more of these laws conflict? 
Well, if you have two moral laws that conflict, you have what's called a moral dilemma. And that's where we can run into some problems. And the doctrine of double effect is an approach to help sort out these moral dilemmas. So now I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking at these, um, these dilemmas um, after we define the doctrine of double effect. Uh, I, I'm used to writing these on the board, so I'm going to try to do it using this whiteboard here to kind of draw some pictures, um, but I may have to insert some pictures as we go along. We'll take a few minutes doing this, and then we'll wrap up. This is going to be a pretty short video. So the doctrine of double effect is, effect is an algorithm that helps you, if you use natural law, to determine whether what you should do if you have two moral principles that seem to be at odds with one another. And so we have four conditions here. And in order to for an action to be proper, for it to be the right action, it must satisfy all four of these conditions. So the first condition is the nature of the act condition. The action itself must be good or indifferent. So you can't, for example, murder somebody to try to achieve something that's good because murder itself would be a bad action. So your action has, that you're considering performing has to be a good action or at least indifferent. The means end condition is the other uh, second condition. The, the bad effect that may happen because you are having a conflict between these principles must not be the means by which one achieves the good effect. So they, you might have, um, for example, you might be able to, you, maybe you're, you're faced with a choice that sometimes uh, superheroes are faced with in, in movies or comic books or whatever, where two people are uh, in, in danger and you have to choose to save one of them, or you have to choose to try to save, and of course a superhero sometimes is still able to save both. But the, the choice that's given to, this, to the person, uh, you choose who you're going to save, two are going to die, both you want to save, but you only can save one. So, But the bad effect can't be the means by which one achieves the good effect. So in other words, you can't, you would, your choice would have to be to save one, not to kill one to save the other. So the means end condition, the bad effect that would happen, would have to be not the way you get to the good effect. It would have to be, uh, it could be something maybe that you see as we'll foresee as we'll look at the third one in just a second. But it, it itself, um, you don't get the good effect through the bad effect. You should get the good effect on its own and even the bad effect may happen on its own. All right, the right intention condition. The intention must be achieving of only the good effect with the bad effect being an unintended side effect. If the bad effect is the means of obtaining the good effect, the act is immoral. The bad effect may be foreseen, but not intended. So, um, for example, if you have uh, two people and they're standing on uh, some kind of balanced, uh, a balancing thing, and uh, if you take one off, then the other person will fall to their death. Uh, and you can't take them both off at the same time for some reason. Then your intention must be to save one, not to cause the death of the other. Okay, so the idea is that the right, your intention in the action must be only to achieve a good effect. Now, if you pull, if there's two people on this balance and you pull one off, you know the effect will be the other's going to be out of balance and they're going to fall off. Even though there's nothing you can do about it, you know that's the case. That's doesn't mean you can't save the one, but your intention must be the saving of the one, not the causing the death of the other. So that, that's number three. The fourth condition is the proportionality condition. The good effect must be at least in equivalent in its importance to the bad effect. So if you, uh, for example, had uh, something where a choice between saving one person or ten other people, you um, have to consider the proportions there. And so 10 people is more important than one person. So you have to work weigh proportionality. Now perhaps you have other factors in there as well that might help ease the proportion. If you had a very young person and a bunch of uh, people who were close to death or were about to die anyway, then maybe those could make some the proportion would work out. But you have to work, you can't 
uh, be disproportionate. The benefit that you get has to be proportionate to the negative uh, side effect that is caused. So you can't uh, just allow it to be completely disproportionate. All right, so I know this is confusing. Let's walk through some examples about this. Um, the idea of just war is the first one. So is there um, a time or, or in a wartime situation, can you use the doctrine of double effect to, uh, to sort through some of the problems that you have with um, actions during wartime? So the, the example that I use is that imagine you're on an allied bombing, uh, planning an allied bombing attack for Germany during World War II. And so there's a, let's say that there's a factory that produces arms, munitions, uh, weapons in a German city. And you want to bomb that factory. And so your intent is to destroy the means of weapon production so that the war will end sooner and lives will be saved. Okay. Now, unfortunately, bombing in World War II was not very precise. So you know that in your attempt to hit that factory, that a number of the bombs will go off target, and where the factory is located, it will probably land in places that are populated by civilians. So can you justify, using the doctrine of double effect, bombing this weapons factory, to stop the war earlier, knowing that some of your bombs will probably end up killing civilians. Well, let's look at the doctrine of double effect. Let's look at these conditions and see if we can do that. The nature of the act condition. The act must be morally good or indifferent. So your action here is not to necessarily even kill people, but to destroy the equipment and the ability of the, of the Germans to produce weapons so that you can end the war. That could be at least indifferent, but it could be even a good action. The means end condition. The bad effect must not be the means by which one achieves the good effect. So the bad effect would be that bombs are probably going to destroy some civilian housing and maybe kill some civilians. But the, how do you achieve the good effect? The good effect is that you've destroyed the factory and they can't produce the weapons. Do you get the destruction of the factory by the accidental um, collateral damage that happens from the bombing raid. No, you get the bad effect uh, incidentally to your good effect of destroying the um, the factory. Okay, so you would probably satisfy the means end condition. The right intention condition. Your intent must be achieving only the good effect, with the bad effect being an unintended side effect. Uh, it may be foreseen but not intended. So. It's, you can bomb the factory knowing that you probably will have bombs that hit in populated areas and kill civilians because your intention is not to kill civilians. Your intention is simply to hit the factory. And, is, and so then you would satisfy the third condition. And then the proportionality condition. The good effect must be at least as equivalent in its importance as the bad effect. So here's a question where there, you know, the, the answer could be different, perhaps. Um, how many civilians do you think are going to be potentially injured or killed during these bombing runs, incidentally? Even though it's not what you're trying to do, you need to figure out how many people might be hurt by this that we're not trying to hurt. Let's say it's a 1,000. Well, if you destroy this factory, do you expect that the war will end sooner to save at least a 1,000 lives? If you say, well, no, if we hit this factory, it's probably going to have very little effect on the end of the war, you might save a few lives, then probably you'd say you can't do that. If you say, no, destroying this factory could end the war and save thousands and thousands of lives, then you'd say, well, it's proportionally. The good effect is equivalent or better than the bad effect. Okay, So those are the ways that you could do that. And so this, this scenario might be one where you're able to justify this action, say, using the doctrine of double effect. Uh, we know that there were bad things that will happen, yet the... Um, we are not trying to cause the bad things, and uh, we satisfy all these conditions, so you can, in fact, drop the bombs on this uh, man manufacturing plant to try to destroy it, because, and that, was, and that would still be moral, because it satisfies the doctrine of double effect. Uh, well, what about abortion? So let's look at abortion. The nature of the act condition. Uh, so let's say that we have someone who has an unintended pregnancy, and they want to terminate the pregnancy. Okay. So, um, the nature of the act condition. The act must be morally good or indifferent. Is 
taking the life of an unborn, morally good or indifferent? Well, I'm sure we can have some arguments there. Uh, if we, The best I think we could get is to say that it could potentially be a morally indifferent action, though, I mean, we may even have questions there. Okay, so the second, um, the second uh, part of the uh, doctrine of double effect, the means in. The bad effect must not be the means when which one receives a good effect. So the good effect is that you do not have an unwanted pro uh, uh, pregnancy. The bad effect is that uh, an unborn life is ended, right? So the bad effect must not be the means by which one achieves the good effect. How do you get to the not having the unwanted pregnancy, it's by the death of the unborn. So that uh, would violate the means end condition there. Okay, the right intention condition. Now, now you could just stop there. If you violated one, you, you haven't satisfied it, so you couldn't say that it is a moral action according to the doctrine of double effect uh, there. But that's, uh, that's one, you know, but we'll go on through it. So the right intention condition. The intention must be achieving of the good effect with the bad effect being an unintended side effect not the means. Um, so it may be foreseen, but unintended. And so we don't have the right intention here because having the abortion is the intentional uh, termination of the pregnancy uh, so that you have uh, you don't have an unwanted pregnancy. So uh, you don't satisfy condition number three. Proportionality condition here, uh, we have the life of the unborn versus uh, quality of life for the, um, for the mother. So, you know, we may not have proportionality either. So um, taking the idea of terminating a pregnancy through the doctrine of double effect uh, is not something that's going to work, but let's consider, is there, are there any circumstances where you might end up being able to justify the termination of a pregnancy with the doctrine of double effect? Well, let's consider this example. Consider you have um, a woman who is pregnant and she finds out that she has a tumor on her uterus. She has some kind of cancerous tumor on her uterus. And the only way to treat this tumor is to uh, remove the uterus. Well, if you remove the uterus and you have a fetus inside the uterus, the fetus will die because you're taking the, the uterus out. So let's consider whether this woman, to treat her cancer, could have what is effect, the hysterectomy, or they would take out the uterus, and that would lead to the death of the child. Let's run that through the doctrine of double effect. So the nature of the act condition. The action is treating the cancer, trying to remove the tumor from the cancer so the woman is not killed by it. That is at least morally indifferent, if not good. Treating cancer may even be described as good. So the action is would be okay. The means and condition. The bad effect must not be the means by which one receives the good effect. What's the bad effect here? The bad effect would be the termination of the pregnancy. What's the good effect? The good effect is preventing the cancer from spreading. So, or getting the cancer out of the body. Okay, so the good effect is not the way you get the bad effect. You don't terminate the pregnancy to take the uterus out. You take the uterus out, which ends up leading to the termination of the pregnancy. So you meet the means and condition as well. Right intention condition. The intention must be achieving of only the good effect, with the bad effect being an unintended side effect. So if your intent is to take out the uterus to stop the cancer and you know that as a side effect that any ch any embryo or, or fetus in that uterus will not survive, then that's an unintended side effect, but that's not what you're trying to do. You may foresee it but not intend it, and you can meet that intention again. Proportionality condition. The good effect must be at least as equivalent in importance to the bad effect. Well, in this case, uh, one is not going to survive, but the other could survive. So you've got proportionality one for one, and that would be at least as equivalent in importance. So in certain cases, you may um, be able to justify an action that would end a, term, end a pregnancy, um, but under normal circumstances, using natural law um, in terminating the pregnancy is probably not going to be seen as an actual um, moral option. All right, the trolley problem is the next one. Here's where I'm going to try to uh, try to draw for us here. So let me erase this um, example where I, uh, you know, I think I can just do that. Uh, let me uh, let me start there. That was a, a failed attempt to try to have a uh, picture. I ended up doing a different way. Now, um, 
the trolley example is as follows. And so this is, I'm trying to make a straight line there. You can see how hard it is to do with the mouse. So these are trolley tracks or train tracks. Okay. And we've got a track that runs here, and then we've got a side track that goes over here. Okay. So these are the tracks. And then we've got a trolley on the, the track here. I'm going to try to give it some wheels. This really looks terrible. It's very hard to do. Um, let me just change colors a little bit here. So we can see, see this is supposed to be a wheel. <laughs> this looks so terrible. All right, so this is our little trolley going down the track. Okay? So now we've got you or a person here at a switch. Okay? Let's make our little person, little stick figure here at the switch. And you have then the following um, two, three, four, five. And these are going to be very bad stick figures here. These are five people who are tied to the tracks, just like in the old Western movies, tied to the train track. And you've got one person on the train track up here. Okay? You are the person at the lever. The trolley is going on down the, down the track. Now, the trolley problem is an ethical dilemma, and it has its own Facebook page. You can get all kinds of crazy different descriptions of this. But this is, sorry for the bad drawing here. Um, here's the situation. This trolley is running down the tracks, and it can't be stopped. Okay? The only action that you can do is you're standing at this lever. If you do nothing, the trolley will travel down the track and run over these five people and kill these five people. The only thing you can do is pull the lever. That's your only choice. Pull the lever or do not pull the lever. If you pull the lever, then it will change the tracks and the trolley will instead go up here and kill the one person who is on the tracks up here. So we'll use this as an example. So if you pull the lever, it does this. That's in the red. And if you do not pull the lever, it goes this way and it runs over those five people. So pull the lever or do not pull the lever. That is the choice that you have to make for the trolley problem. We'll come back to this several times through the semester. But the question is, what is the moral choice? Let's go back to our um, doctrine of double effect here. And let's look at what the action is. Okay, um, So the action here would be to change the direction of the trolley. So you would change the direction of the trolley, which would lead to a person dying who was not going to die. Okay, so that's your action that you would have. Okay, so you could even throw in saving five lives, but causing the death of someone who would not die to save the lives of five people who would die. So the nature of the act, is it morally good or indifferent? Is intentionally causing the death of someone who was not going to die morally good or indifferent? Probably not. Probably you're going to say cause, intentionally causing the death of someone who would not have died, uh, except for your action, would not meet that criteria. Okay, So right from the beginning, we, we are not going to fit. The means end condition. The bad effect must not be the means by which one achieves the good effect. So the bad effect is that you cause the death of someone who uh, was not going to die. The good effect is that you save the lives of five people who are going to die. So the good effect is achieved by through by or through the good effect, the bad effect. So you fail the means end condition test again. The right intention. The intention must be achieving only the good effect, but you, by switching the tracks, you are intentionally uh, causing the bad effect, so you fail the third one. The proportionality condition. The good effect must be at least as equivalent in importance to the bad effect. The good effect is saving five lives. The bad effect is losing one life. Okay. Proportionality, yes, you got it. You should pull the lever. However, three of the four um, you did not satisfy. So for the doctrine of double effect, you would have to, and you're dealing with the trolley problem, you would say, it is wrong to pull the lever. You should not pull the lever. If you pull the lever, then you are causing the death of an individual and saving the lives of fives. But if you do nothing, 
You did not cause the trolley to get there. You're not responsible for the trolley doing what it's doing. If you pulled the lever, you would be responsible for the death of one, and you're not responsible because you failed to pull the lever for the death of the five who were just going to die anyway. That's the doctrine of uh, double effects view of the trolley problem. We'll come back to that in utilitarianism and talk about it um, in a few lectures again, and uh, we'll see some very different answers to that. Okay, here's another example. Sally's father and a nuclear bomb. Suppose that Sally, uh, she loves her dad, and her dad has rigged a nuclear bomb in somewhere in New York, and it's going to go off in the next hour. The question is, can we torture Sally to get the location of the nuclear bomb so we can defuse it and save the lives of, of lots of people in New York? Would that be moral to do? Okay, so the question is saving millions of lives, and that's the good effect. The bad effect is torturing someone to give us an answer. Okay, the nature of the act condition, the action must be morally good or indifferent. Is torturing someone morally good or indifferent? Probably not, so we probably fail there. The means ends condition, how do we get to the good effect? The good effect is that we are saving lives. Well, we get there by torturing, so that would be, we'd fail that one. Right intention condition. The intention must be achieving only the good effect, with the bad effect being an unintended side effect. Well, torture would be the way we get to it, so again, we failed that right intention condition. Proportionality. The good effect must be at least equivalent in importance as the bad effect. Well, it's much more proportional, but it doesn't satisfy them. So we could not say it would be moral to torture her to give us the location of that bomb, even if um, it were important it was going to save lots of lives. So, okay. So that's how natural law would deal with that, uh, with the doctrine of double effect. And then finally, turning on the TV and a bomb. So in this example, the um, you have a television in your house, and you want to watch a educational show. And you find out, or you know that, someone has rigged your television so that if you turn on the television, a bomb will explode in a populated area in a city, uh, another city. So it won't hurt you, but... If you turn on your television to watch this show, a bomb will go off. It will cause death and destruction and hurt a lot of people in another city. Okay, so let's run this through the doctrine of double effect. The good thing is that you watch a television show that's good for you. It's an edifying show. The bad effect is that people will die. And let's just say, you know, 20 people die because of a bomb. Okay, so the nature of the act. The action must be morally good or indifferent. Is it morally good or at least indifferent to watch an edifying or educational television show? Sure, you have no problem there. The means end condition. The bad effect must not be the means by one achieves the good effect. The, um, do, do you get to watching the show by killing people? No. You're turning on the television. There's nothing wrong with turning on the television to watch the show. You happen to know that the effect in another place will be that a bomb goes off and it kills people, but the way you have the good effect of watching the, the educational show is not because of the bombing. Okay, It's not through the bombing. The right intention condition. The intention must be achieving of only the good effect with the bad effect being an unintended side effect. Again, you have no problem here. right? You may, be force, you may foresee that, but it's not intended. I, I can see that if I turn on my television, something's going to happen, but that's not what I'm intending to do. I'm only intending to watch the show. So you've met these three conditions. Now what about the proportionality condition? The good effect must be at least as equivalent as importance to the bad effect. Probably you don't satisfy this one. So um, whatever good that would come from watching this television show probably does not outweigh, it's not proportional to the bad that will come from the bomb exploding. So you would have failed again the doctrine of double effect in saying, um, turning on this television knowing a bomb is going to blow, blow up. So it would not be moral to turn it on the TV to watch that show knowing that that would happen. Okay, so these are the uh, examples of what we've got so far. Um, we've covered natural law, we've looked at ethical relativism, both subjective and conventional ethical relativism. Next time we will start to, we will look at uh, the role of religion in ethics. So uh, make sure you complete your readings, make sure you complete your uh, discussions, and I'll see you in the next video.